Hi everyone, welcome back to this short tutorial from Pathology Made Simple at ilopathology.com and supported by the AI study tool called Visdolia. At the end of this session, I'll be posting the practice session via Visdolia so that your understanding will be much better. So, in continuation with the autoimmune diseases series, today we will begin with systemic lupus erythematosus, understanding of systemic lupus erythematosus, particularly everything about autoantibodies in systemic lupus erythematosus. So, we will see what is systemic lupus erythematosus, a bit about epidemiology of systemic lupus erythematosus and everything about autoantibodies in systemic lupus erythematosus. What is systemic lupus erythematosus? This is an autoimmune disease involving multiple organs where there is production of autoantibodies. Right? Particularly, anti-nuclear antibodies are important when we talk about systemic lupus erythematosus. This primarily is a type 3 hypersensitivity reaction, which means the injury is caused mainly by the deposition of immune complexes. But it can also be a type 2 type of hypersensitivity reaction when there is an antibody-mediated direct injury. But remember, SLE is predominantly a type the hypersensitivity reaction. Now, let's see the reasoning behind this name, the systemic lupus erythematosus. Systemic because it involves multiple organs throughout the body, whereas lupus is a Latin word, you know, uh, which means old. This was called lupus because the facial rash which was developed in these patients, you know, it was thought to resemble the bite of the wolf or the face markings of the wolves. And erythema means red. So, erythematosus, it's talked about this reddish rash across the cheeks and nose. That's a very classical butterfly shaped rash on the cheeks and the nose. So, that's how systemic lupus erythematosus name came into being for this disease. A bit about the epidemiology. The fairly common disease means, you know, the prevalence of the disease is around 1 in 2500 in certain populations. It's predominantly a disease affecting females. Female is to male ratio is around 9 is to 1, particularly in women of childbearing age, around 17 to 55 years of age. But then the female is to male ratio comes to around 2 is to 1 in SLEs or for SLEs developing during childhood or after the age 65. The disease most commonly manifests in 20s and 30s. Having said that, you should remember it can manifest in any age group. But then the, co the most common age group is 20s and 30s. Now, let's talk about autoantibodies in systemic lupus erythematosus. And these autoantibodies are developed against a variety of self-antigens. And these self-antigens could be categorized into whether they belong to plasma proteins, whether they are protein phospholipid complexes, whether they are self cell surface antigens, or whether they are the components of the cytoplasm, or whether they are the components of the nucleus. So, these are the various categories for which autoantibodies develop. The nuclear components, the antibodies to the nuclear components are the most important ones and they are called anti-nuclear antibodies. Okay? So, these are the most common and the most important antibodies which are found in systemic lupus erythematosus. Before I talk about anti-nuclear antibodies, let's complete these you know, uh, autoantibodies against these components. First one is plasma protein. The antigen against which antibodies are developed could be complement components or could be clotting factors. When we talk about complement components, it could be C1Q, C3 and C4. We know that C1Q is involved in the early stage of complement cascade. C3 and C4, they are part of immune complex clearance mechanisms. You know, C4 particularly, it's part of classical complement pathway, which is important for clearing antigens. So, remember, the complement system is meant for the immune complexes to be cleared off, you know, for the, for the unwanted immune complexes to be cleared off. So, the deficiency of these complements is actually associated with increased susceptibility to systemic lupus erythematosus. So, you can have antibodies against various components like cytoplasm, nucleus and everything. So, deficiency of these complement components, which normally clears the immune complexes, in these cases, if there is a deficiency, it's difficult for it to be cleared. That's why it's 
associated with increased susceptibility to SLE. But then now we are talking about autoantibodies against these components as well. So autoantibodies against these may lead to more deficiency. It can exacerbate the disease. The second component of plasma proteins is the clotting factors, which include prothrombin and factor VIII. Prothrombin is factor II, which we know that it is the one which helps in conversion of prothrombin to thrombin. And then this thrombin is the one which converts fibrinogen to fibrin, a very important mechanism for the clot to happen. So whenever there is autoantibody against these factors, particularly prothrombin, it can lead to impairment of clot formation. Antibodies against factor 8 can lead to bleeding disorders. So, anti autoantibodies against clotting factors can lead to various manifestations in terms of bleeding. The second one is protein phospholipid complexes. Two important uh, you know, proteins which bind to phospholipids you need to know. One is beta 2 glycoprotein 1 and second one is cardiolipin. And the autoantibodies are referred to as antiphospholipid antibodies and the syndrome is referred to as antiphospholipid syndrome. These are the patients who manifest with dominantly uh, symptoms of thrombosis and miscarriage, particularly in child women of childbearing age when they are pregnant. Cardiolipin is a phospholipid in the inner mitochondrial membrane. Okay. So, if you have autoantibodies against this antigen called cardiolipin, you know, of course, it causes thrombosis. But then, these are the kind of patients, you know, they give false positive syphilis test results. That's because the non-treponymal test for syphilis, you know, they use cardiolipin as one of their antigens. So, if the patient has antibody to cardiolipin, it will turn positive. The test for syphilis will be positive and that's a false positive syphilis test because the patient will not be having syphilis but the patient will be having anti-cardiolipin antibodies which react with cardiolipin which is the component of this particular test. See, the other protein phospholipid complexes can be annexin, protein C and protein S. Sometimes, some of these antibodies in white row, you know, they interfere with partial thromboplastin time testing, PTT testing, because it prolongs clotting time. And that is the reason these antibodies are also referred to as lupus anticoagulant. Normally, the autoantibodies causes what? Thrombosis. Whereas, in this case, it is not causing thrombosis. Instead, it, it prolonging the clotting time and that's why it is referred to as lupus anticoagulant which basically is a paradox. The third important category is the cell surface antigens which could be on the surface of lymphocytes which is basically you know the autoantibodies are against the CD45 antigens which disrupt the immune regulation. It could be on the neutrophils no, it targets the autoantibodies targets the CD15 on the neutrophils because CD15 is involved in the addition and migration of white blood cells. So, autoantibodies can reduce immune response effectiveness, right? Third one is autoantibodies against glycoprotein 1b on the platelets. You know that glycoprotein 1b helps in addition. So, autoantibodies can lead to defect in the platelet function, right? The last one is glycophorin A on erythrocytes. This is a siloglycoprotein on of the erythrocyte membrane so which is involved in cell integrity integrity of the red cell membrane so autoantibodies against this results in hemolytic anemia so you can have various manifestations depending upon the type of autoantibodies generated in this disease the next category is cytoplasmic components so what are the components in the cytoplasm for which autoantibodies develop the first one is actin which is a microfilament right which provides structural support if you have autoantibodies against this, it disrupts the cellular architecture and function. Second is antibodies against tubulin, which are microtubule. So, autoantibodies can disrupt intracellular transport. The third category is LAMP1 and LAMP2. These are basically lysosomal membrane proteins, which are very important in autophagy. So, whenever you have autoantibodies against these proteins, it can lead to accumulation of cellular debris because the cellular debris will not be tackled if there is no autophagy, right? And that results in more inflammation. It can be the ribosomal proteins, particularly S3, S7 and S9. Remember, these can be seen both in cytoplasm and nucleus. These proteins, I mean, these are the ones, these ribosomal components are involved in protein synthesis. So, autoantibodies bodies against these ribosomal proteins can result in or can impair the translation and cellular function.
The last but not the least is these RNA molecules. 5.8 is RNA and other RNA molecules which are used for various cellular processes. So, autoantibodies against these RNA molecules can disrupt gene expression. Now, coming to the most important part of autoantibodies in SLE that is anti-nuclear antibodies. So, what are the components for which antibodies develop? It can be antibodies against the double-stranded DNA. Antibodies can develop against the histones H1, H2A, H2B, H3 and H4. And antibodies can develop for the non-histone proteins bound to the RNA. See, antibodies against double-stranded DNA if you have these antibodies, it is associated with severe disease manifestations, especially nephritis. And antibodies against histones, histones we know that it is a core protein component of nucleosomes and you know it affects DNA packaging and gene regulation. If you have antibodies against histones, it affects DNA packaging and gene regulations. Another important antigen for which autoantibodies develop is Smith antigen, ribonucleoprotein antigen and RBO and LA. Okay, Smith antigen is the one which is involved in mRNA splicing. So, antibodies against these antigens are very highly specific for systemic lupus erythematosus. Remember this. Ribonucleoprotein, this U1 RNP is involved in RNA processing. If you have autoantibodies against this protein, it results in mixed connective tissue disease and systemic involvement. RO is basically a single strand A or SSA. LA is single strand B or SSB. It can be seen in both nucleus and cytoplasm. So, autoantibodies against RO and LA can be seen in SLE, though they are more commonly associated with Zogren syndrome. Now that we have studied all the autoantibodies against various self-antigens, these two autoantibodies, particularly against the double-stranded DNA and Smith antigens, they are highly specific for systemic lupus erythematosus. So, let's recap. Autoantibodies against SLE could be of plasma proteins, complement components and clotting factors. It could be protein phospholipid complexes, particularly cardiolipin and beta 2 glycoprotein 1 can act as antigens. The cell surface antigens could be on, I mean, the antigens of lymphocytes, neutrophils, platelets and erythrocytes. Cytoplasmic could be acting tubulin, lysosomal membrane proteins, ribosomal proteins, etc. And the most important ones, the nuclear components, particularly the double standard DNA, histones, non histone proteins bound to RNA like Smith antigen, RNP antigen, RO, and LA. So the most important thing you have to remember from this session is the antibodies for double standard DNA and Smith antigens are the most common ones and the most specific autoantibodies for systemic lupus erythematosus. Now, having known that there are various autoantibodies which can be seen in SLE, the next important thing which you need to know is why and how these autoantibodies are developed and what are the consequences of having these autoantibodies. And that's etiopathogenesis, which I'll be discussing in great detail in my next session. Now that you have come to the end of this session, I would suggest you to click on the link below in the description as well as in the pinned comment for you to learn actively. This is multiple choice questions or the practice questions via Visdolia, which can have multiple choice questions, short answers and the clinical scenario based questions. The best part is that you will get feedback. It's fun to learn. I would suggest you to try these practice sessions via Visdolia. Thank you for watching. If you have liked this video, hit the like button. Do comment if you have any queries to ask. Don't forget to subscribe if you find this video useful and do share. Stay tuned till the next session where I'll be talking about etiopathogenesis of systemic lupus erythematosus.